present sort of quick whiz through about uh, of hip impingement in, in athletes. Uh, I'm sure this is a very knowledgeable audience, and, but it's important to just to revise these things. Uh, CAM-type hip impingement uh, develops because of this aspherical sort of extension of, of the femoral head down the front of the head-neck junction. And if you've effectively got a square peg in a round hole, what happens is as the hip, uh, as the hip flexes up, you get this, uh, this shearing force uh, on the articular cartilage, and it pushes the labrum out of the way initially. So the, the uh, labral injury is not such a big feature of cam impingement, at least in the early stages. But unfortunately, the shearing of the articular cartilage predisposes to uh, osteoarthritis of, uh, of the hip, or indeed it's the earliest, signs, uh, earliest type of osteoarthritis of the hip. With pincer impingement, the main problem is uh, prominence of the anterior rim of the acetabulum. And so when the hip flexes up, the, the main conflict is between the anterior rim of the acetabulum and the femoral neck. And uh, this, is, this pincer impingement is really characterized by severe labral injury. And the labrum is densely innervated, and therefore is, uh, this is uh, very painful when you get labral tears in, this, uh, in, in these patients. I'm sure you can appreciate that if the patient has a very good range of motion or is, is uh, athletic and always working at the extremes of their hip range of motion, then clearly they can tear their labrum in the absence of any anatomical abnormality, as was alluded to in the previous session. Uh, FAI is uh, very common in athletic uh, populations, and if you look at, uh, look at uh, elite soccer players, uh, up to 70% of them uh, have radiological signs of impingement. If you look at symptomatic NFL players, 94% uh, of them will have radiological uh, changes uh, of, of uh, hip impingement. And it seems that the, the CAM deformity develops during childhood, and uh, some recent work even suggests there's a dose-response relationship. So if you start playing a lot of soccer before, before you're 12, you're more likely to have uh, a CAM deformity than if you play a lot of soccer after the age of 12. Hip impingement is, is associated with, with all types of athletic endeavour, really, but it's particularly those sports where you spend a lot of time in flexion rotate, and rotating under load, so the oval ball games and hockey. But we mustn't, mustn't forget, of, of course, ballet and other, other types of uh, performing arts. Hip impingement presents with uh, the symptoms of a torn labrum and, and, sh and the damaged articular cartilage at the front of the acetabulum. So it's this insidious onset of, of groin pain. And this is punctuated by uh, episodes of stabbing or catching. And quite often the patient describes the pain using uh, metaphors involving, involving sharp objects. They localize the pain using, using the thumb and index finger of the hand, the so-called C sign, and, and they, they cup it round the front of their hip. They may also do it using their two index fingers, and uh, the two index fingers converge on the anterior rim of the acetabulum, the so-called so coordinate fingers. Presentation of impingement in athletes uh, is, is sli uh, slightly different, and the main reason is because they're presenting much earlier uh, in, in the disease process, because they're using their hips more, and they're presenting with earlier disease. And quite often, uh, patients will describe a subjective feeling of hip stiffness that they, they've always had since adolescence. They've never been as flexible as some of the other members of the team. They notice a reduced explosive power as they, as they set off for a, a sprint. They may not be able to change direction, even though they may be able to run in a straight line. And there's a general weakness or lack of confidence uh, in, in the leg. First half may be OK. Half-time team talk, that's going OK. But halfway through the second half, they start getting pain in the groin again. And they may get post-game ache, and then that continues for another day or two. It may be misdiagnosed as a recurrent groin strain. And it's often the patients themselves that misdiagnose it as a recurrent groin strain. It may, I mean, as, as advances in diagnosis uh, have, have, uh, have been made, it's quite often not the medical staff anymore, the physios who are getting it wrong. It's actually the patient. They just assume they've got a recurrent groin strain. And of course, we must remember that it can coexist with adductor or groin disruption, as we've heard in the previous session. There may be acute injuries, an acute falling or twisting that, that suddenly leads to sudden pain in the groin, or it may be associated with a, with a period of intense training, particularly deep squats under load. And of course, unfortunately, even though the, the athlete thinks they can rest and just stop playing and it'll all go away, unfortunately, each time they get, they get back to, to exercise, if they, if they haven't done, uh, had any tr appropriate treatment, then uh, the, the injury will recur. 
We're no doubt all familiar with the impingement test, which is uh, 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 one of the signs of hip impingement on examination. Uh, by flexing, adducting, and internally rotating the hip, uh, you're, you're forcing a conflict between the femoral neck and, and the torn labrum, and it reproduces the patient's pain. But there may be some more subtle findings. The patients obviously may be hypermobile, particularly uh, female, uh, female athletes. The range of motion is usually well preserved, but there may be a reduction in internal rotation, 90 degrees of flexion. And I, I, I'm sort of keenest to draw attention to this slide on the right. This is this um, patients with with impingement, with hip cam impingement particularly, tend to lie with the lower limb in, in just slight external rotation. And uh, this is a gentleman, by the way. Um, he, his, he's had surgery on his on his left leg, which is nice and straight now, but his uh, his impinging. Uh, right leg just lies in subtle external rotation and you, you can quite often see that. Uh, how do we treat hip impingement? Well it may be non-surgical treatment, obviously we're going to hear about that very shortly and of course there's surgical treatment and uh, with surgical treatment you want to repair the injury, you want to correct the bony deformity and you, you want to rehabilitate the patient. And uh, this is a full thickness articular cartilage uh, defect, absolutely classic of CAM type impingement, bit of microfracture uh, and uh, hopefully that's all going to get better. But of course the key part of that operation is to remove the cam. And this young lady's got a torn acetabular labrum. Uh, we're just uh, fixing that with a, with a couple of anchors uh, and that sort of stabilizes, stabilizes the labrum and then f finish off obviously by, um, by reshaping the femoral head neck, head neck junction there. Now one of my remits was to talk about the results of surgical treatment um, and I'm delighted to say that uh, uh, the the, uh, the group in Zurich, Michael Leunig's group in Zurich, have recently uh, reviewed all the, all the data on this, and it's, it's been conveniently published in the British Journal of, of Sports Medicine. So this has uh, just been published. It's, it's very helpful for me today, so I'm grateful to Michael. But they looked at 18, 18 studies with, with over 1,000 hips in nearly 1,000 athletes. And um, about a third of them were professional athletes, about a, a, a third were uh, recreational athletes, <laughs> and then the rest, college, high school, not, not, not identified. And I'm pleased to report the results of surgical treatment. They, they felt that 87% of, of athletes returned return sport after their impingement surgery, and 82% returned to the level they were at prior to the injury. And one of the key determinants of return to sport is the severity of the articular cartilage damage. Unsurprisingly, professional athletes are more likely to get back to, profes to professional sport, and presumably it's because they need to feed their families and, uh, and, and pay, their, pay their bills. Um, but this the second observation that is maybe less, less clear is that e there are still quite high levels of, of dissatisfaction with the results of surgical treatment, even though they may get back to sport. And the implication is, is that they're, they're still having to play with residual symptoms. Uh, or they're not, may, maybe don't feel that they're quite as good as they used to be, uh, or obviously, or that they want to retire and, and, uh, and they, they can't. So in terms of the, the current issues in hip impingement, I think, I think in terms of non-operative treatment, in terms of rehabilitation, I think perhaps the most, m most interesting area is actually um, uh, modifying uh, training programs and exercise schedules of, of, of child and adolescent athletes to hopefully prevent uh, the CAM deformities uh, 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 occurring at all. In terms of surgery, um, we're clearly very good now at correcting the bony deformity and still not very good at repairing the articular cartilage, uh, even though there are many, many methods to do it. Uh, labral grafting for the deficient or, or severely injured labrum is, is clearly increasing in prominence and uh, is, is available now. Um, and another in promising area is, is adjuncts to surgery, including uh, PRP and, uh, and stem cell therapy. And some literature is just starting to come through there. Uh, imaging is, is also continuing to advance, and uh, an area that we're just starting to look at is the relationship of, of, the, of the, the pelvis to the lumbar spine and lumbar pelvic movement. In, in terms of influencing the orientation of the acetabulum. And this is a key strategy in the non-operative treatment uh, of, of hip impingement. Um, but advanced MRI uh, imaging with, with Degemeric or, or T2-STAR uh, is, uh, is, is certainly uh, promising. Uh, th this is, uh, these are some images uh, that uh, have kind of been lent by uh, Christoph Zilkins in Dusseldorf. Um, of some uh, T2 star scans. Uh, and actually these show the, the actual quality 
of the, the articular cartilage. So the worse your cartilage is, the more damaged your cartilage is um, biochemically, the greener and yellower it is. And you can see that's, that area is over the cam, and this area is at the edge of the articular cartilage. And in theory, by doing these kind of scans, you could, you could see a failing hip and therefore potentially intervene uh, before, uh, before there's actually full thickness cartilage damage. And of course you can animate this and you can see that the, the area of impingement is where the, the articular cartilage is, is looking, looking the worst. So clearly uh, prevention is better than cure and we have to ask ourselves can better athletic training actually prevent the formation of CAMs? Can better imaging uh, allow us to intervene in, uh, before the articular cartilage is too severely damaged? And uh, can we do better surgery so even though the injuries occurred, we can prevent uh, recurrence and, and improve um, biological healing? Thank you very much. <laughs>